Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Bill Barbazat, who is Emeritus Professor in the Department of Medicine uh, and by specialization, a gastroenterologist. And so very well qualified to speak on our topic tonight, the history of endoscopy. Gil. And uh, thanks for weathering the weather and coming out here. Please excuse my taking off uh, the mask, uh, which I think probably will be better to talk. When I prepared this talk, I realized how fortunate I've been to live in this day and age where I've been able to see the evolution of gastroenterology and endoscopy. As you'll see here, I had a great fun in looking up some of these details. Well, people have always had an interest to see inside things and to look a bit further. And the first records of looking into people goes back to ancient Egypt. But at that time, most of it, well, all of it really was looking into cadavers linked with religious ceremonies and it extends back a long, long time ago. The papyruses who record some of the rudimentary tools, but no record of any use in patients. For obvious reasons, the mouth, rectum, vagina, less so the urethra, which provided more of a challenge, were apertures where people concentrated their gaze. Hippocrates wrote about the speculum for hemorrhoids. The Romans left a catheter in Pompeii, which is currently in the museum. Galen had what he called a catopter, which apparently is an anal speculum, which is currently in the Naples Museum. And even in the Muslim literature, there's limited amount of information on endoscopy. So why did it take such a long time for this to happen? Well, all of us know what it's like wanting to look inside. Who of us as a child or as an adult hasn't peeped through a keyhole or anything? You see what's on the other side. And the problem is that looking into the gut, it's dark down there. My parents were French speaking, and I remember one of their aphorisms was, il fait noir comme dans une vache. It's black, just like the inside of a cow but no, no reflection on we humans, but we are just as dark inside. So you have to have light and that is a huge problem. Light requires fuel. Light often produces heat at the source of the light and distance it follows the law of inverse squares. In other words, if you say two feet away from the light, and you increase it another two feet, you decrease it by four, three feet, nine. So a length away from the source of the light is very important. Body access is limited. So the easily available apertures were the easy targets initially. And then of course, there's a human tolerance. How much can you take? before it becomes unpleasant. And I must say, during my little life, I've seen procedures which I thought, oh, you know, I don't know whether I could go through this if I were a patient. That's bloody awful. <laughs> to a procedure where people have it in the morning and go back to work and finish their day's work. The other exciting thing about this is that the evolution of endoscopy went parallel with the evolution of other things 
in science and in development. And going back to the 17th century, to von Leeuwenhoek, who actually wasn't an optometrist or a lens person, but a draper and haberdasher. And he had a hobby grinding lenses and was a self-taught scientist. And he looked at these little things in water, which he called very little animal cues. I thought it was a cute statement. And uh, he was, he rose to distinction and awarded an FRS in London in 1680. And just to give you a size of magnification, about 50 to 300 magnification. The first person really to have anything to look inside someone was a chap called Bozzini. Interesting man, his parents, well, his father was an Italian nobleman and got involved in a duel and killed another nobleman and thought that his long-term future wasn't in Italy and uh, emigrated to Germany. And young Philip Bozzini was born there. And being of Italian ancestry, he was never quite fully accepted by the Germans or the Austrians. He was always, you know, this Italian guy. He was a very broadly educated person and uh, was known for his maths, his philosophy, his chemistry, and his art. And he what, had what he called a light conductor. And it was a, a set of reflections with candle and mirrors to focus in a certain place. And what he developed really was a modified sister scope where he could do a limited amount of ENT, gynecological, urology, rectal, and we made his name and fame were with wounds. And he had trouble with the Austrian establishment where he was most of the time uh, because of his ancestry, but he was such a good military doctor that they kept him on. He was also a dedicated professional and wanted to see patients himself. And uh, he, at a young age, you can see here, 36, he saw a patient with typhus and uh, died of typhus. The first person to have the name endoscopy attributed to him was Desormeaux, the French surgeon. And he improved Bassini's Lichtleiter. And you can guess from this, the crude source of lighting, that he had a better source of light so he could see better. And his gasogene was alcohol plus turpentine. I mean, imagine that, using that as a source of fuel. And he used lenses to concentrate the light. And that was a picture from the internet of uh, Desert Moore's uh, sister scope. Sir Francis Cruz was an Irish surgeon neurologist who emphasized the uh, Desormore scope expanded it and with optics used by lenses and uh, really improved the vision and the ease of use. He also was one of these uh, ingenious people. And I thought I'd put it here just to show it his swing uh, uh, manometer. And this is a little trumpet thing, like a stethoscope. And this is where you put your eye. And you pushed this instrument onto the artery, say, over here. And the harder you pushed, the needle came round. And when your pulse stopped, that was your systolic blood pressure. So he was really a, a, a shrewd thinker and developer of things. And this is a theme that goes right through endoscopy. Maximilian Nitzer, another German. Hildegard, please, uh, and Martin, please forgive my German pronunciation of names here. They might work. 
not to be oh thank you thanks <laughs> well come to me Nitzer was a German physician and he had an interest in lenses and we often saw see this in in the saga that people with broader interest put these together to evolve a better and better instrument. And the other point that is so important is collaboration between different people and different disciplines. And this is how we progress in medicine for heaven's sake. So he collaborated with opticians and mechanical engineers and applied this uh, microscope technology so that he could look down his scope. But again, it was short distances because of the tyranny of light. To get down into the stomach, the light had faded. You know, the difference between the throat and the stomach or urethra and the colon is huge. And he improved the optics and got a little bit further. Joseph Leiter was a well-known instrument maker at the time, and he had a close but rather fractious relationship with Leiter. And Leiter is quite a famous person. He came to light a little bit later in the story as well. The famous Kusmol, and he was one of these real medical geniuses. Many of us will remember many of Kusmol's signs and uh, features. And uh, I was reminded that he was the first to describe dyslexia, which he described as word blindness, which I thought was a particularly uh, good way of, of seeing things. And he advanced Desormeau's scope using external gasoline as his light source. He first tried this on a sword swallower, but it was really difficult to see into the stomach. And besides saliva, there was gastric acid to deal with, which will vary in amount in, in people, as we know. So that was really a difficulty. This, there is record of a Scot called Campbell in Glasgow, who uh, thought of practicing with a scope in a sword swallower, because he thought a sword swallower is much more likely to swallow one of these things rather than somebody at large. And not surprisingly, the Glaswegian sword swallower said, I know I could swallow it sword, but I'll be, and the quote was dot, 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 if you're going to put that trumpet down my throat. So he didn't get very far, but Kusmol did see into the stomach and was the first to do so, and he linked up with the famous lighter to, to improve his scope. We then came to von Mikulik Radecki. And he was a Polish-Austrian surgeon from the famous Bullroth School after Bullroth gastrectomies, who were pioneers in gastric surgery, particularly related to cancer. And he also co cooperated with Leiter, where they used prisms to direct the light. And you can see that this is becoming more and more of a specialized field. And he developed the, the sister scope further, which became clearer and clearer because there the distance was not so great. And he was the first so-called to reach the stomach. And you can see here that some of his scopes had a bend in it. And he introduced that bend so that he could see, get more clearly into the stomach. But apparently it was quite a tricky instrument to introduce as uh, if you put the bend the wrong way the patient didn't do too well and that spawned the chevalier jackson esophagoscope and the chevalier jackson esophagoscope would there still be some in the operating theaters now mark yeah, I saw 
Well, a description of a Chevalier Jackson esophagoscope is really a curtain rod with a light in it and a lens at the top end. And this was still in current use in the 60s and 70s. And for foreign bodies, etc., it was very good to fish out things, but it was an awful instrument and also had a significant uh, complication rate. We then come to another major, major milestone that enabled the flourishing of endoscopy, and that is electricity. We know the roles of Franklin and Faraday in uh, describing the phenomenon and then enhancing and controlling its power. And then Edison came with the light bulb. But apparently, that there was a Canadian or two Canadians, Woodward and Evans, who, uh, who first developed the light bulb. And uh, they could not market it as well, and it didn't do too well. And it took Edison and Swan, Edison from the US, Swan from the UK, to really market the bulb. And the idea that got through to them, <laughs> it's so simple, but it, it never occurred to me that the heat that you see in a light bulb, if that is exposed to air, the oxygen burns it up and it disappears. But the idea of having a light bulb is to take out the oxygen so that you get the heat and you take out the oxygen so that it doesn't catch light. So that was the big breakthrough. But we're reminded too that it was only until the 1900s, the 20th century, that we had reticulated power that one could link to an endoscope. And that takes us to the next major step. And <laughs> I shudder to think that this is where I entered the piece of the observer on the side. Rudolf Schindler was a very famous man and apparently a delightful character. Uh, he worked as a gastroenterologist and developed his endoscope in Germany and was really a passionate person. He employed an artist because the photography wasn't up to it at the time there, who drew up, and I've got the charts at home of the artist's work from Schindler, and I've got, thank you, Chris kindly brought the Schindler scope. This is it here. What he did is introduce a flexible end to it. And then you connect it up here, the light, which was transmitted to down here, near the flexible tip there. And you also had a thing where you con connected the bulb and blew up so that the stomach distended so that you could see. And the very first scope I ever passed was one of these. And I promise you, it was awful, absolutely awful. And <clears throat> it was also a dangerous instrument because uh, uh, perforations weren't all that uncommon. But Schindler, in his series, published 400 scopes without an incident. And uh, it was then that he went public and said, you know, I'm teaching this and uh, it's, it's a worthy instrument. Well, Schindler was Jewish. He was arrested by the Nazis in 1932 and saw the writing on the wall and went to Chicago, where there was a major center for gastroenterology. My mentor in the US, Maud Grossman, grew up in that stable. And after, uh, shortly after spending a few years in Chicago, he moved to California, where he lived for many years 
until his wife died. And his wife, he and his wife were really very, very closely linked. And virtually all his work was recorded by his wife. And she was really uh, very much involved in his publications. When she died, he went back to Munich and married again and uh, died not all that much later. He is regarded as the, really the father of endoscopy. He was a teacher, an author, a scientist, and apparently a fine musician. From there, we moved on to the gastro camera. And I remember the gastro camera. We had one in Cape Town where one of our radiological colleagues did the uh, deed. And um, I know that it was used here in Dunedin because when I moved my office after retiring, and I moved my office on the eighth floor, I was asked, what are all these boxes here? And they were left over from, I presume, Brian McLaurin must have used the gastro camera. Well, it was first ideaed up by the Germans again. They were very advanced with lenses and cameras, but uh, the challenges just became too much. Then as far back as 1949, uh, a, a Japanese surgeon where they had a high incidence of gastric cancer and an Olympus engineer in their camera department got together and thought we can do this a lot better. So they developed the gastro camera, which is very genius when you come to think of it. And you can see the marks here, yep. And there was a roll of film in the end. It came past the lens where they got the picture. There was a light here. And the exposed film went up into the length of the tube. And what they did is put the camera down. And then they had a certain number of, they put in air. And then they took picture one this way, this way, this way, this way around, and then back this way. There. And uh, I, I remember this being used, and it was very useful in Japan where they had a very high cancer incidence, but never really took on in the West. It was soon eclipsed by the uh, fiber scopes in the 1950, late 50s, but you will see from the shape of the scope and the technology used in the scope that the Japanese obtained a huge amount of knowledge of how to build an endoscope. And then we come to the hero of the piece. This is Basil Hershowitz. <clears throat> whom I got to know very well indeed. He was a real gentleman, a nice guy. He was a uh, South African born to uh, a Jewish immigrant family from uh, Eastern Europe. He was very bright, finished his school at 15. So did a few extra courses at Wits University. He did paleontology and physiology before doing medicine and surgery. And his initial interest was to become a surgeon. But he argued, if you're going to become a good gastric surgeon, you need to know a lot about gastroenterology. So as people from South Africa often did, they went to the UK for the OE. And he went to the central Middlesex where he joined Sir Francis Avery Jones. And he was a, a lovely man, a, a very gentle English gentleman, always dressed perfectly, driven around London in his Rolls Royce. And he was a typical English gentleman, but really nice guy. Anyhow, uh, while there, uh, Hershowitz did his thesis on uh, pepsin and pepsinogen. 
And that really became one of his lifelong interests and he published on that right until, oh, virtually 2000. And he developed his endoscope uh, endoscopy experience using that horrible instrument, the Schindler Wolf. And I'm sure he had similar feelings to me. Surely we can't carry on doing this to patients. There must be a better way. Um, he then went from London on a fellowship to Ann Arbor, Michigan. And there he worked under Dr. Marvin Pollard, a gastroenterologist, and uh, Prof. Horace Davenport. I met both of those. In fact, I looked at the job at Ann Arbor. Uh, Pollard had retired by then. He was a powerful, intimidating man. And really, uh, I didn't take to him. Uh, I, had, I had dinner with him uh, as part of the interview process. And I must say, I didn't like what I saw. Uh, and Horace Smirk was, again, the Englishman in the States, always dressed in a suit, a Serbic tongue. And he could write articles cutting people to pieces. I mean, he was just really uh, an interesting character, but a good place to be for somebody interested in acid because Davenport was the world uh, authority on histamine. As often happens in the States, uh, as I learned in my uh, fellowship there, once a week, the fellows and residents meet and they have an informal discussion over a few beers and pretzels. And this was also part of the action in uh, Ann Arbor. And one of the people presented an article in Nature on the optics of light transmission. And this really struck the imagination of Basil Hershowitz and he thought oh, there might be something in there in an endoscope. And being the type of person he is and he knew England, he went back on holiday to London where he visited the Imperial College of Science and looked at what they had written in that Nature article. He came back to Ann Arbor and linked up with Wilbur Peters, who was a physicist who had worked with Dow Corning in the glass industry. And uh, he had mates in there and they gave him little rods of glass, which they could melt down and uh, pull them out to what they called hair taffy to look at the possibility of producing light images. And this really, <laughs> it, 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 those of us who've learned to live and love living in New Zealand, this is real number eight wire stuff. And they were really in the middle of that. They co-opted Larry Curtis as a student to help them in their endeavors, which was done in a basement room in the hospital in Ann Arbor. And they argued that if one fiber could submit light, if you put a whole lot of fibers together, like the compound eye of a fly, you would get a bigger picture. But what happened is that the light went out of each fiber into the other fiber. So the light didn't only transmit down, but transmitted across and a lot of the image was lost. But then, it seemed that Curtis and Peters had the breakthrough of that. And what they did is put an additional glass layer with lower reflective index. In other words, there is the ordinary glass core and then another layer of glass different reflective index there so that instead of going out 
of the fiber, it bags down. So the image is transferred down. So that when you have a bundle of these, you have the sum of the images, not the spread image. So they developed what was a crude scope with the cost from a $5,000 grant and $250 of odds and ends gleaned from the department. That's really a model of true multidisciplinary collaboration. And there you can see uh, uh, Peters and uh, Hershowitz. They presented the meeting, uh, the, the, uh, their new scope at the American Optical Society. A prototype was made. They got the interest of ACMI, American Sister Scope Makers Incorporated. And their first one was from uh, uh, sister scope back to a gastroscope because with electricity they could have a more powerful light and one set of fibers transmitting the light and then the image coming back up the scope. They had a commercial model which was patented by all three of these young authors in 1961 and published in The Lancet. And this became the standard workhorse, as opposed to the current ones with uh, a ratchet that you turn this way, the ACMI one had a joystick, which I've never used, but I've seen these. The first one that Michael Shackleton had here uh, had had one of these uh, joysticks. Well, later years, 1958, Hershowitz had to leave Ann Arbor. It was a sad event, really. Uh, we knew that he'd left. And uh, at the time of his being unhappy there and having to leave, he met Solly Marks, my future boss in Cape Town, who was doing his OE at that time. I was still a student then uh, in uh, the USA. And uh, Basil Hershowitz recounted to me one evening, as I say, I got to know him very well. I enjoyed the hospitality of his home. And one evening we were sitting over two or four bourbons, and he talked a little bit more than usual. And he talked about his departure from Ann Arbor. And uh, apparently the story goes, and I heard this directly from him, that uh, Pollard, his boss there said, you know, called him in and said, well, you've done very well, haven't you? Yeah. You've uh, developed the scope. It's been uh, wonderful to see the developments here. We used to work from one or two rooms. We now got four or five rooms. We've got lists of applicants for fellows and residents. Uh, publications are coming out ever before, more commonly than ever before. But the problem is we've got two bosses and I'm not moving. So Basil Hersowitz got up and looked for other places. And he joined initially Shay and Komarov. And Shay is one of the co workers of Solly Marx. Komarov was, uh, came from the Pavlov School in Russia. So again, he was a strong acid link here. And uh, there was in, in Cape Town, we, our department in gastroenterology was a Jewish department. I was the only Gentile there. And they, 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 they were called the acid mafia and uh, commonly known as the gastric Jews. And uh, they, were, they were really a fine bunch of people. Anyhow, um, while he was there, he wasn't entirely happy in Philadelphia. 
And there was a lot of money in the states poured into southern states at that stage because they thought that the southern states were too far behind. It was at the time of recognizing black power and uh, that they were, wanted to establish a unit there. And it was suggested that uh, he go to uh, Birmingham, Alabama for a new division of gastroenterology, which he did. And he made a very big success of that, he was there for the rest of his professional life. And for a number of years afterwards, he remained productive. And he spawned wonderful people, including George Sachs, who was uh, one of the people who developed the proton pump inhibitors, uh, which we uh, enjoy using now. And uh, George Sachs took over from my previous mentor, Mort Grossman, in Cure, uh, Los Angeles. And Basil Hershowitz was academically active until uh, 2008 and died just a few years ago. Well, the rest of this talk will be really where has this endoscope gone and what has it permitted? Well, he's permitted the development of biopsies, of taking samples for microbiology, polypectomy, cautery, screening, all these things would hardly be possible without open surgery. Dilatations, particularly of the esophagus. And you can see here, you can put a tube over the narrowing and with a Grunzig tube, which dilates to a particular predetermined size. It's not a balloon that blows to any size, but you can have a five millimeter, 10 millimeter, 15 millimeter, and that can be passed through the scope. And then helicobacter pylori would not have been discovered without the ability to take lots of histology and microbiology of the, uh, of the upper gut. Foreign bodies are the cause for a lot of fun, really. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is a 50 cent New Zealand piece. You remember the 50 cent pieces? They were pretty big. And some joker in the pub said to his mate, I'm sure you couldn't swallow one of these. So, yeah, of course I can. Yeah. He swallowed. So his mate said, well, you wouldn't do that again, would you? <laughs> yeah, sure. You should do the second one. And uh, it's unlikely that that 50 cent piece size would go through the pylorus easily or through the gut easily. So uh, <clears throat> Lawrence Warabitz was here at the time and thought he'd have a go at taking them out. And we have a, a coin removing forceps, which instead of being like a V like this, which can't grip the size of the coin properly, it has a U-shaped uh, clasp to the biopsy forceps to get on each side of the uh, uh, of the coin. But these two 50 cent pieces stuck together and with gastric juice and mucus <laughs> they couldn't be separated and it took quite a bit of lateral thinking for Lawrence to finally get it out. Other things that are common are toothbrushes from bulimic patients uh, who let go of their toothbrushes while they're inducing vomiting. Uh, little batteries, which are really lethal, particularly in children. And another, I think I just have time to tell the story of the a patient from Cherry Farm. This was in the 1980s and we got the message that this chap was an inveterate smoker and he'd swallowed a big lighter and they thought he might well vomit it up sometime, but he didn't. And it was there for a week and they thought, well, you know, this is a bit dangerous because there's acid down there, there's plastic covering, 
and this chap won't stop him smoking. So they asked us whether we could fish it out. So these lighters were freely available. We got a model and we practiced with loops of where we would grab it and how we could hold it to take it out, etc. And the day was arranged where he came to A and E, and a very nervous kind of guy and said, to A and E, uh, oh, do you mind if I have a smoke? And uh, in nineteen eighties, it was still possible near the hospital. I said, yes, but you can't smoke in here. You have to go outside. So when I said, oh, I don't have any matches. Do you have a lighter? So they said, yes, they took a lighter, went out and came back. And Jeff says, where's my lighter? I swallowed it. <laughs> so he had two in there. It was, it was a bit of a challenge, but anyhow, it was lots of fun. Uh, <clears throat> Endoscopes are now used for other procedures that before the scope revolution um, required open surgery. And one of them is to put in a gastrostomy tube into the stomach to feed people who cannot swallow or who are dependent on uh, a feed directly into the stomach. And I remember presenting this at the Surgical Journal Club in the days when gastroenterology and surgery still worked as almost as an entity. And they said, mm, I wonder how this, whether this will take off. But it has. I mean, it's a standard procedure in gastroenterology now where the endoscope is put in the stomach and then the light is shone. You can see where the light is shining, put through a catheter with a balloon on the end, and then put a bung on the stomach side, a bung on the outside side, hey, presto, it can be done in a short while as an outpatient procedure. So this is one of the simple offshoots from the scope. Fiber optics was a major step forward, as you can imagine. And in the old scopes, as you can see in this picture on the left, you had to look down the instrument to see the picture. And being fiber optic, you had a very good view, but it was slightly granular because of the nature of the fiber. And if you put a filter in there, you can see what it looks like. And these black spots are fibers that have broken. So as the scope got older, you got more and more black dots, made it more and more difficult to, to see. And then the digital era came in. And it was absolutely beautiful. I mean, the, the image you see there is perfect. It's like <laughs> reading anything. And <clears throat> the next major step, of course, was to show that on the screen. Now, I remember thinking now, I wonder how long it's going to take me to adapt from looking down the scope to looking, doing it on the screen. And one scope, I mean, it was really just wonderful. And you can imagine for teaching, it was possible before to put on these ones a sidearm for your pupil and you to do their endoscopy and supervise what the pupil saw. But it's nothing like this here, which really is very instructive, not only for the pupils, but for the assistants. I mean, the nurses were really excellent, or they are really excellent in uh, observers and helpers in this. In the scope cleaning has evolved enormously. I shudder to think in the old days when a lick and a wipe was enough. When we moved to the new gastro unit in Cape Town, we had a special thing on a trolley with a wet suit rubber that was nice and soft for the scope. And after a scope, we put the scope down a kind of gutter, flush it with water, and then 
uh, put a swab in alcohol and put it down the scope and then put glycerine on the scope. Okay, next patient. And I kid you not, but I went to a presentation in, uh, in Brazil where they showed that at that time, patients coming in for their second and third scopes, this was after the discovery of H. pylori, that if you weren't H. pylori positive the first time, your chances grew exponentially the more scopes you had. I mean, this was just obvious, but we just didn't know it. Uh, <clears throat> then more powerful chemicals became available and submersible scopes were developed and that led to washing machines. And now it's a highly intricate, very sophisticated way of cleaning scopes that one can get good records to know exactly what scopes have gone through what and they are tested at regular intervals for bacteria, for viruses. So it's become a completely different procedure to what it was before. Specialist scopes. I can show you here. Thanks for bringing that, Michael. I hope I'm doing it the right way here. Right, right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, this is a colonoscope. And you can see on the end there, near the specialist openings and then the ratchets turned, work it from this end. So you can get front views, side views, oblique views for different purposes. And the diameter of the scope, that's quite a thick one, but they vary from four millimeters to 8.8 .8 .8 millimeters. So it's uh, a reasonable size to swallow. The flexibility varies tremendously. And now colonoscopes are being made where you can vary the flexibility from one part to the other to help you round straight bits and more windy bits, various lengths, magnification lenses on the ends, different lights with filters, laser lights that come through. So there are a whole lot of variations there. The biopsy channels, you can have one biopsy channel, two, and now they have mother and daughter scopes where you can put a smaller scope down a bigger scope to go through into bile ducts or other areas. And you can record the whole of the small bowel eventually from top to bottom with various scopes. And there's a cartoon in one of the uh, gastro journals of two endoscopists playing chess with a chess board in the middle of the small bowel. And having access down into the gut with such clear vision, it gives you access to other organs as well. And here you see an ERCP, endoscopic, the endoscope, retrograde, because your injection is retrograde, cholangio, the bile duct, pancreatography. So you get bile duct, sorry, bile duct, pancreatic duct. And that enables people to pull out gallstones stuck in this area and avoid surgery on occasions. And one wag 
who was a visitor in the Gastro Society from England. We took him to see the Meraki boulders and he said, oh, let me take a photograph of that and say, this is the country where they have big all blacks, but they also have big gold stones. I'll tell them this is where, where we take the gold stones we took out. But the, uh, the uh, barn duct is not only the refuge for stones. One day in Cape Town, I remember, we heard a lot of shouting and excitement coming from the endoscopy room and the registrar shouting, go, Ben, go, and we're wondering what's going on. Ben was the endoscopist. And we went there, and Ben was chasing a roundworm, encountered a roundworm in the upper gut, and the roundworm disappeared up the bar back, and Ben was trying to catch it as, as it went up. Well, complications of endoscopy are well known, but rare now if it's done properly, very rare. Perforation, of course, bleeding, particularly when you take polyps, infection, but that shouldn't happen with proper cleaning. Problems with sedation, obviously various degrees of sedation don't agree with some people. With ERCP, possibility of pancreatitis, and then preparation. Uh, as you can imagine, the colon needs to be clean. And in the original clean preps, they used non-absorbable sugars because they act as an osmotic agent, kept the fluid in the gut, and it was an internal flush system, as it were. And those of you who've watched Billy Connolly give his description of that will get a vivid description of what it does. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, what happened, though, when they used sugars initially, is that the sugars being non-absorbed went through into the large bowel where there are bacteria, and we know there are bacteria there. The bacteria used to feast on the sugars, and one of the products was methane. So that when the endoscopist came in and cauterized the polyp, there was an explosion, and that explosion was proportional to the amount of methane. And there were some very nasty uh, uh, problems with that. But in the symposia nowadays, people uh, go over the complications very carefully. And it is said that you have, if you haven't had a complication, you haven't done enough endoscopies. So uh, it is a fact of life, but most of them uh, are, are overcomable. Endoscopic ultrasound is another development where an uh, ultrasound probe is at the end of the scope. Here you can see the ultrasound scope, and it gives you the ability to literally look at the various layers of the gut, and it's, it's quite an amazing development. Then there's the pull cam. You can pass this around if you like. This is a sample one. <laughs> the, the, these are swallowed and they small, developed by an Israeli company initially. The battery lasts eight hours, flashes two per second, and on its way down, over 156 degrees, takes pictures of the gut on its way down. And the person wears a recording apparatus. And then when it passed through the other side, it's fished from the toilet. And then uh, that doesn't matter because the important data is recorded in there, can be played, and you can get a picture of the uh, gut. And it's very useful in uh, looking for small bowel pathology. I won't go into endoscopic surgery because uh, that's another field completely and uh, requires special trading. 
and training in endoscopy itself. I'm embarrassed really at gastroenterology and endoscopy initially. The rudimentary training we had, the old English teaching school, you know, see one, do one, teach one, was uh, a common saying. But now you really have to go through quite extensive, and I'm just looking through the latest ones this morning that came through the Gastroenterology Society newsletter. Huge number of criteria people have to have before they can be accredited. Mannequins are very useful, practicing on mannequins rather than on people, maintenance of standards with postgraduate registration, continuing education programs, and then international standards and international meetings to look at endoscopy standards. So leave a little time for questions. This is a photograph I took myself of Basil Hershowitz, the last World Gastro meeting that I went to in 2003, where he was there at Bangkok. And a typical comment of his, Science is a living entity that may be likened to an onion where every layer of discovery shed from the outside is replaced by another growing in the core. This fortunate fact will continue without end to provide work and enjoyment for future scientists. And he really enjoyed his work. And I think most of us who have done endoscopy really enjoyed doing endoscopy. Thank you.